This video is going to have to start in the live stream area because uh, the device I'm looking at is so huge that there's no way I'm going to be able to fit it in the bench. It is a positive input ventilation device made by Vent Axia, and this is quite an expensive device. We're talking about £350 for one of these. Let me describe what it does. You install this in your attic and it's got a fan. It is a 24 volt fan, but it does in the rating plate say 12 to 24 volts. And it's got a control panel here and it also has, for optionally, it's got a heater built into the end to preheat air coming into your building. Because the idea is that this unit brings air in, it filters the air. I'll show you the filters in a moment. It filters the air and then it pushes air from the attic, pulling it in through the eaves. It pushes it in the, from the attic down into your house via this vent, which diverts the air sideways to avoid causing a draft. And in doing so, it creates positive input ventilation, PIV. This is the whole point of it. It pressurizes your house very slightly by bringing in that fresh, clean air and it pushes all the stale air out of the house and all the mold spores and stuff like that and through any crevice it can find, through the carpet, through the floor, through the door frame, whatever. And that positive pressure just means there is continuous flow of fresh air. And this means that all the humid air gets blown out of the house and all the musty, stale air gets blown out and it apparently solves problems with mould and dampness quite affordably because the thing only draws about, say, 10 watts typically, a fairly high setting. So to couple this to the unit, you've got slinky pipe here. And also, so you don't get fiberglass being blown into the house, there are these two filters. Now, this is where it gets a bit weird. You see, these go on either side of the air inlets. There's two of these. And in all the promotional pictures, they've clearly stuffed them because, like, this is the air inlet, and they're absolutely rigid and, you know, they're just like, here's a big filters. But in reality, this is what they look like when they're installed. They just flop down and it's pulling air in so it's going to crumple them up. It's like the worst designed bit of the thing. Anyway, we're interested in a couple of things. <clears throat> oh, I should also mention, we're interested in a couple of things. We're interested in the circuitry in here because I'm going to open this and we'll take a look at what's actually inside it. A switch mode power supply and a little computerized control here. But there's other things worth mentioning. It does monitor the temperature. It's programmable for a reason. If the temperature in your attic is very hot, but not too hot, it will boost the speed up, optionally, to bring a lot more air in. Uh, normally, though, when the temperature is close to the house, it will just lower the pressure to an appropriate level. And you can put it to pre-programmed thresholds. You can either do it all manually, or you can just say it's going to be a one, two, three, four, or five bedroom house, and it will just accordingly adjust it to an average speed that suits the volume of the building. Uh, the other thing it will do is in winter, if the temperature is too low and you can set this, it will bring on a 500 watt heater. And that could add to your electricity bill quite significantly over a period of time. So use it sparingly. Use it, don't use it too high. But the idea is it makes up for the low air temperature coming in and just boosts the temperature up a little bit. The other thing it does is if the attic gets way too cold to the point that you know it can't really maintain a decent temperature even with the heater it will just turn itself off just to avoid over chilling your house and uh, potentially causing freezing problems now there's a couple of optional things here there's a little connector here that's the temperature monitor for the uh, heater which is controlled by this cable but there's also a little four pin connector that you can add accessories like a boost switch that lets you just push a button or flick a switch and it'll boost the air pressure up a bit just for that time just to get any musty odors out of the house or whatever but uh, it's a wee four pin connector and you can get the adapter that goes into that four pin connector and all it does apparently is bridge two pins it's about 100 quid or something like that <laughs> i mean let's face it uh, I, i've been doing experiments with a computer fan in my ceiling just to see if i thought this was going to be good it's a fairly low volume air throughput but i like the freshness I found that it does, it creates a slight draft of fresh air through the house, it's very nice. But anyway, I digress. Let's get back over to the bench, which is through there, and we'll take the circuit board out of it and uh, take a look inside and see what makes it tick. One moment, please. Okay, this is a rather bulky device, so let's explore the inside. Here is the fan over here, it's a dual-sided uh, centrifugal fan. 
We have a 24 volt power supply down here, quite a complex power supply with auxiliary functionality as if it's designed to take another switch feed in and signal over to the control PCB which is here. Uh, the control C PCB uh, monitors a temperature sensor here but there's also a temperature sensor, an optional one coming in this connector from the external sort of heater unit that bayonet caps onto the front and the heater unit is also switched via this card here which has a looped mains feed coming in the output to the heater but it's actually got a signal going through an opto isolator to a triac in here. Now I've taken some pictures of the circuit boards and we can explore them closer. I will say there's some oddities about this unit. I got this from eBay a while ago. It was unusually cheap. I think I've found out why. It's It's got what looks like a botched repair in it. Interesting. It's fixed now, but uh, let's explore some of the circuit boards. Okay, let's explore. And this isn't going to be a full-blown schematic dive. It's basically just going to be looking at the circuit boards and exploring them. Because uh, when I originally made this, though, I had very limited time at the time of doing it. And uh, a couple of annoyances, these connectors, the main power connectors, did not come off very easily. I mean, I just decided in the end just to leave them on, which means that I had to take pictures in situ, which is why you got this big bright dot in the middle. It's not as well lit as the usual ones. The uh, control circuit board, on the other hand, I did get a decent picture of. So things worth noting about this. Here's the mains incoming supply. There is a fuse, a NTC inrush limiter, by the look of it, um, Suppression components and comm mode suppression, rectifier on the other side, and then smoothing, filtering, smoothing, and then a fairly decent transformer. This power supply looks quite expensive. The output capacitor is a, a beefy one. For it, for the duty it's doing, it's actually pretty big. Um, there is an auxiliary input that's not used. That auxiliary input, as I'll show you on the other side, goes over to this opto isolator via two resistors. It looks like a live to neutral type sort of thing, um, a switched live that uh, sends a signal back via this middle yellow wire. Now notice that this black wire is closest to this hole here. This is kind of important. It uh, looks like a factory fault that they had to fix. Uh, that's made all the more annoying by the fact that I, uh, apparently, I looked up the time I purchased this. It did come from eBay. It was incredibly expensive. It was the full price uh, of about £380 I paid for that unit. Very expensive subject for a video. Anyway, this is flipped over now. So that connector there, the one that's close to the hole, is black and it's plus 24 volts. So I think they may have actually had a problem with the wiring looms being mispinned and they fixed it perhaps by turning this connector around to reverse polarity. There's another blob, of, you can see this solder work here and you can see solder work here of this, what it turns out to, I presume, be a class Y capacitor, a surface mount version. And this mounted to the edge of the board. When I opened the unit up, this was actually just hanging off the circuit board by one end. Um, and when you actually slot it into the slots in the unit, the circuit board goes in runners, and unfortunately this component is well and truly in that position, uh, and a lot of pressure is put in it. I actually moved this component in. I desoldered. When I resoldered that end, I then subsequently uh, reflowed the solder again, just moved the component away from the edge because that is under a lot of strain in the unit. Uh, looking at the power supply again, the supply circuitry is going there. There's the bridge rectifier and there's the capacitors around there. There is another little capacitor. Let me show you that one. That is the capacitor for powering the chip. And here is the chip, the chip that runs the switch mode power supply. It's a very complex chip. That's very weird. It, it actually bridges from the input, the primary side, over to the secondary side. It's actually bridging the, the two sides of the transformer. So I'm guessing it's got integrated uh, feedback circuitry. Given the huge number of components, it's odd that they've used such this a big chip. But it's also got a MOSFET instead of a diode, so it's using it as what they call a synchronous rectifier, where the chip, the switch mode chip, is actually turning the MOSFET on in place of a diode, which means it's got very low losses. But this thing is not high power. It's 24 volts, but it's not. It's only about half an amp. It's very strange. Uh, other circuitry worthy of note, we have um, 
the snubber network across the primary here for uh, taking strain off the transistor inside this, the control chip, um, and that's more or less it. The octo isolator has those two resistors limiting the current and then just signals over to this LS. Live switched, I'm not really sure what that's for. Let's take a look at another circuit board that I couldn't get out. Uh, here is the one that controls the heater. It looks as though it's got a facility to put a relay on it, but it, uh, in this case it's got a triac, a BTA08, and that is controlled by an opto isolator, possibly a zero crossing point switching opto isolator. And the rest of the circuitry on here is just ultimately filtering and also the current limiter for the opto isolator that feeds into the, uh, the gate of the triac. I do wonder what this other circuitry is for and these other spade connector positions. It must be a universal circuit board they've got other applications for. Okay, let's take a look at the control circuit board. This is the most interesting side of the control circuit board. It shows, let me zoom in a little bit and just make sure it's focused. There's a microcontroller that's doing all the magic. There is a seven segment display and they're driving it properly. They've got a transistor per digit and then they've got that, what I presume are eight resistors, one for each segment plus the uh, decimal point. So it is a multiplex display, but it is like using a high pin count. It's not cheating anyway. There is an odd connector there that does have a position on the front panel that basically it's misaligned with the hole on the plastic housing and they put a sticker over it to hide the hole. Um, here's the incoming supply. That connection was uh, perplexing because I was probably about on the circuit board looking to see what voltage it was actually running at because the motor is suitable for 12 or 24 volts. And uh, this connection, the black wire, but that is actually positive. Um, there is a diode across here because the this is the CS, the switch, this is the positive and this is the negative. If you get that three pin cable the wrong way round, uh, it's not compatible. You you have to have it the right way round. But what they've done is they've kind of uh, they'd kind of turned that other connector and swapped the cable round. They'd done weird things to try and connect correct a wiring problem. But this thing has a diode across the pl plus and minus to shunt it if uh, the polarity is wrong, I presume. Uh, but then it's got a, um, or is that? I see that says 24. I'm not sure that is. It, unless it's for clamping. Not sure. But anyway, there is a polarity protection diode here. And it feeds to a common bus with a couple of fuses, one going to the 3.3 volt regulator, and it's not like an active switching regulator, but look, I don't know how hot that's going to get, because it is 24 volts, and it is producing 3.3 volts from that, so if it's a linear regulator, it's going to get pretty hot. Another one goes out to feed uh, things like the heater control function uh, at board and the uh, the output to the fan. I think this is the fan at this end. It's got a current sense resistor and various transistors on both sides. There's a lot of circuitry. It just seems very, very dense with the circuitry. Um, other things. Yes, there's a auxiliary input here, and there's a auxiliary for the heat. Um, this auxiliary input is the boost function that lets you flick a switch remotely, and it apparently just bridges a couple of pins and brings up a temporary boost mode. And this is a temperature sensor for the heater module that goes, the optional heater module that bayonet caps in the front. Then there's this connector, presumably for analysis, programming, not sure. Um, but if we take a look at the other side of the circuit board, we can see, keep in mind this is flipped effectively, um, that there's a dual op amp dealing with both the connector for the internal thermistor and the optional external thermistor for the heater. And this uh, is the connection that... I was hoping they'd be taking power out to the this for auxiliary functions for this boost connector, but in reality, it appears to be just two negative connections and one signal back with lots of protection circuitry to protect the chip from rogue signal uh, st electrostatic discharge onto the cable and stuff like that. 
Uh, this diode here and this transistor does suggest that is a relay on the heating tr the uh, heater control the triac board. So they've just left themselves the options of a relay and a triac. Um, and this uh, is the fan control. I don't know if it's just continuous power out to the fan or the pulse of the modulator. I guess a pulse of the modulator. But it does have quite a few wires going out. So is that for tackle, for feedback and stuff like that? Yeah, quite complex. A lot of circuitry. I get the feeling that the a Chinese copy would be much, much simpler. But that's more or less it. Uh, it's an interesting unit. Um, I've got it on test. I'll let you know how that goes. So far, um, I'm liking the freshness. It's uh, definitely a higher airflow than my little homemade version um, because it does have that squirrel cage centrifugal fan for applying a decent pressure. And the power consumption at the settings I've got it at is 10 watts. So it's nothing to really worry about in that sense. Although in winter, if the heater comes on, I've set it to its, like, the worst case scenario sort of thing like that I've set it not to come on too early that will potentially boost quite add quite a lot of power to that but interesting device and I shall let you know in the future how how it works out if it actually improves this place much the very calm the island because it is a very humid island a lot of mustiness this is an old building and uh, hopefully this will have a positive effect but I shall let you know how that goes